You are listening to Productivity Straight Talk with your host, Amber De La Garza. She is passionate, direct, and sometimes a little sarcastic, but always gives you what you need to succeed in business. Now, here's your host, Amber De La Garza, the Productivity Specialist. Welcome, and thank you for listening to Productivity Straight Talk. Today is episode 54, Automation Systems, Leveraging Your Greatest Ally with Tanya Connor Green. If you are an entrepreneur who wants to take consistent, massive, focused action in your business and life, then you're in the right place, and I'm so glad you've joined me today. I'm really looking forward to bringing this episode to you because you get to meet our guest, Tanya Connor Green. Tanya has been coaching female entrepreneurs who struggle to make money in their business since 2015. As a former corporate prisoner who was often referred to as the little pit bull in the insurance company where she worked, Tanya is keenly aware of how important it is for her clients to succeed in their business and not go back to the soul-sucking nine-to-five job. She has a unique approach to her business coaching because of her strong focus on human connection and vulnerability. Tanya focuses on helping women move beyond the fears and self-doubts that keep them hidden behind their computer screens so that they can get visible, get vulnerable, and stand out from the crowd online in order to make six plus figures in their online business. Now, for the you gentlemen that are listening, this episode is not just for the females. We are going to be diving deep into all things automation. So if your business needs more automation, then listen up. In listening in on my conversation with Tanya, you will discover how automation takes away the need to hustle for clients. The cheap hire you should make who might wind up being your very best employee. The automation system you absolutely must have to keep money coming in. The secret to getting to home base with your potential clients and so much more. So let's dive right in and meet Tanya. Hello and welcome to Productivity Straight Talk, Tanya. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I am really looking forward to this episode. We've been chatting a little bit before getting on air and like a few of my interviews, I'm like, hold on, we got to stop. Let's make sure we're on record so our listeners can listen in on this great stuff that we're chatting about today. So to get us started, I would love for you to share with our listeners a little more detail from you because I did just go through your bio, but give us what your business is about and who do you serve? Mm -hmm. I work with female entrepreneurs who are wanting to usually quit their nine to five or have quit their nine to five already and who want to grow their online business. So anyone who's service-based and generally the people that come to me are not making as much money as they want in their business. So I help them cut out the fat and cut out the shiny objects so that they can focus on working with clients, making an impact and making more money so that they have more freedom. Oh my gosh, that's great. Well, we could have a whole topic, an episode about shiny objects, but I have a (laughs) really good topic for us to talk about today. All right. Give us a little background about how did you come up with the name Wholehearted Business Coaching? Mm, That's such a great question. I was obsessed with Brene Brown when I started my business. And the first chapter of the book, The Gifts of Imperfection is Wholehearted Living. And so as soon as I saw that, and as soon as I read what wholehearted living meant, that was something that I really wanted to incorporate into my business and into my coaching specifically, because I really agreed with that like vulnerability and the power of connection and things like that with my business. I didn't want it to be all about money, even though that's what I help people with. But I wanted it to be focused on deep, vulnerable connections, especially in social media these days. We can be very removed from other people and really building that back in for success. Yes. So when we were chatting back and forth, you had actually realized I had that book as one of my top 10 book recommendations on my website as definitely a resource that I recommend to everyone. It was a very, very good book and has helped me quite a bit as well. It's so good about not getting pulled into perfectionism, especially when you're building a business. You don't want perfectionism to prevent you from actually taking action in your business. 
Otherwise, we would never begin. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, any longtime listener of Productivity Straight Talk knows that that is something that I do share vulnerably, that perfectionism is something that I have to consciously work on because if I don't, I'm not getting my things out in the world, all the ways in which I can help people because I'm always looking at trying to make it better. And I always give it this caveat is that perfectionists don't really think we make things perfect. We just want to keep making it the best, the best, the best that can be and tweaking. And sometimes that definitely gets us in a place where we do not take the action we need to grow our businesses. So there was lots of learnings in there. I'm glad that we shared that commonality. I think that I am interested and I think my listeners are too. Can you give us some insight into what a typical day looks like for you running your business and who supports you? Like who's your team? Who are the people that let you do what you do? Uh, Such a good question because I think that that's a lot of the stuff that people don't see behind the scenes is that it doesn't all happen just by you on your own. So if you are just doing it on your own, that might be something that's coming up for you that you could get a team to help you and you'd be able to do more. But a typical day for me is certain days of the week I take clients, certain days of the week I do podcasting and other days I take off or I work on my own business because as a business coach, it's really easy to spend all of your time helping other people build their business and not spend any time on your business. So I make a conscious effort of having two days during the week where I only work on my business. And then the other days I'm working with my clients. So because of that, I don't have so much time to do some of the administrative stuff in my business. So I do have, I guess, web developer program support who helps me create my content for my programs and a copywriter who is exactly like me. She's very inappropriate and (laughs) we definitely get along well because that was always the first thing I wanted to outsource when I started my business is I don't really love writing. So So my little secret too, yes, my little secret, sorry to interrupt you, but I couldn't, uh, I copywriter for me all the way as well. And I don't have one that is permanent with me other than my assistant, which is she's wonderful at writing in my voice, but with regards to like website stuff and maybe like sales copy, I'm still looking for someone that can get my voice because I'm very particular. Well, I don't think I can write the best even in my own voice, that sounds weird. I am still looking for someone that can just make my voice sound so much better with written words. So I agree. Oh, I have somebody for you for sure. (laughs) She is epic. And you would never be able to tell the difference between my writing and her writing, except that mine takes me eight hours and hers takes her maybe 15 minutes. So that's leverage. (laughs) Oh, baby, is it leverage? And it's so fun. Like I think that's the best part about having a team is having people you actually enjoy working with. I love the people that I work with. And I don't really work with anybody who is not a woman, one, and two, who I don't really believe in what they're doing. And like, they're like a partner. I think you have to build a team of people who care about your business just as much as their own. Yes. So before I so rudely interrupted you, you were going down your list of people that support you. So let's finish that out. Sorry about that. Yeah, no. So I also used to have a really great VA. I'm on the hunt for a VA now, but I do have some people that support me with my admin stuff. I also have hired my little brother sometimes when I need extra support. He's young and needs a job. And I think that's awesome to be able to help him. But I'm always looking for more administrative support. But do you ever find that it's hard to find someone who is a virtual assistant who does it the way that you would do it without a lot of direction. Because all my other team members don't need any direction. I'm not a micromanager. I don't want to micromanage people. So I want to be focused on my business like in my clients. I really like people that can do their own thing. Yes. So my team is pretty well and totally independent as well. My assistant has been with me for nearly four years and, you know, whether she knows it or not, and she's listening to this, so I'll just say, hey, Crystal, Uh, (laughs) she's, you know, promoted up to what I call my content manager. Like she is phenomenal at assisting me in all aspects of marketing me and getting me out in the world. And that has become such a big part of my business that we etched out a lot of administrative off her plate. Whereas when she first got hired, that was actually what she got hired for until I found this amazing talent that she had. And now that's the role that she's currently feeling. So like you, I'm actually on the hunt for a virtual assistant as well. And I've been going back and forth whether I needed someone locally or could I get away with virtual? And I think that I've decided I'm going to go virtual. 
Mm -hmm. I definitely have used an amazing virtual assistant before who was so good. Like I didn't need to tell her anything, but I find a lot of people online will say they're an expert in something. And when you dig a little bit deeper, maybe not the case, but I'm also thinking about if it would be better to train someone from the very beginning, like a fresh meat And then you can train them in the way that you would want to do something. Yes. Yes. I've thought about that too. And I've had that same experience, Tanya. I had, we'll get into my system or your systems or our systems, whatever we want to talk about. I know that's what we're going to end up talking about today, but I did. I hired an Entreport consultant and it didn't go as planned and it wasn't what I expected. And then I did a lot of interviews and then I got on the phone with a lady that, well, on Zoom that knocked my socks off. Like before the end of our conversation, I was like, and how do I pay you? Like, how do I give you money? How do I hire you? <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And I was like, I got to tell you, it's not just because we got on the phone. You are like my seventh interview and you're it. And let me tell you why I think that you're it. And so I repeated all the things that I had felt that she genuinely brought to the table. And it's hands down, like having someone that truly walks the walk and it's not just, yeah, I can do that. They need to have true experience in whatever you're bringing them on to do. And this person definitely has that. Yeah, I totally agree because I really teach my own clients that you need to know how to be able to do it to know if someone is telling you a bunch of BS. Because if they're like, oh, I'm an expert and they don't know how to do something and then you don't know what it's supposed to look like, you won't know that it's bad or good. So... I definitely am all about watching over people, at least at the beginning, but like finding people that can actually do the things that they say. Yes. So, yes. Okay. So I've got to share a story with you really quick because this is me geeking out with you. So yes, we're supposed to leverage through others and we need to invest our best time into our best activities. Anyone listening has known I said that. But my little known fact is that when I just got into... So in October, I started my business on Entreport and I literally would spend my morning that I would be putting my makeup on, watching how-to videos and training videos on Entreport (laughs) with no expectation that I would ever be the person doing it. I was watching them only to know to get my mind wrapped around what was possible and what I could ask someone else to do for me in my business and to know if they were doing a good job. And the whole thing, like I just only did it to expand my knowledge so that I could better grow my business through others kind of a dork Mm -hmm. out thing, right? Like who watches like YouTube videos? (laughs) I do. I do all the time. That's like a little secret. Like some of my clients, I'm like, guys, you have to check out the support library. They have so many videos. That's how I've taught myself to do a lot of this stuff because I've become super techie, but I was never techie before. One of the things I always share is that with my clients, especially is that I really didn't know any of this back in September, 2016. So a year and a little bit. And I didn't know any of this stuff. So you can learn it and you can figure it out. There's so many resources, but you have to actually take the time and implement it. And also like if you're going to hire somebody, at least know how to direct them as to what to do. And like, I love finding out like all the new things that are happening. Like I tried to sign up for like Apple Pay on my order form the other day. Turns out it wasn't available to me, but I went through all of the trouble of setting up every little piece, like becoming an Apple merchant and all of this stuff. So you do want to know what's happening so that you can integrate it into your business. Absolutely. So one of the reasons that I love being bringing entrepreneurs on is so that we can just kind of tell a story of productivity challenge that you may have experienced in your business. How did you overcome that? And then what are the benefits of it? And for any new listeners, the reason why I do these, and they are like some of my favorite interviews ever, is because I don't want people to just listen to the podcast or anyone, any expert or read a book and be like, that's great in theory, or that's great for them. But it doesn't happen in real world. So I am on a mission to finding business owners that are challenged just like every other listener here and then sharing their story of how they came through it so that we can all learn and be inspired to go take that action in our businesses. So Kenya, what is a challenge that you have experienced in your business as you've been growing? Well, I would say the very first challenge was that I was working when I grew my business. I wasn't one of those people who was like, threw in the towel and I'm just going to try and build this business on the fly. No, I was making over $100,000 in my corporate job and I was working for my family also. So they were like the CEO of the company. So I couldn't exactly just like throw in the towel and say, see you later. And they're like, you have this great job. 
And I didn't even know that I wanted to leave at the beginning, but I knew that I wanted to coach people. And I knew that I wanted to have some sort of side income or potentially go down the entrepreneurial path in the future. So I built my business to more than my corporate salary before I left. So I was working a corporate job and I still had to build my business. I had a group program. I had one-to-one clients. I had to do all of these things, which by the way, is why a team is so important. Yes. Because <laughs> there was no way I could have done that without them. Because during the day, I was like shut off from my business. And when I came home, I was doing my business. Now, I did have to give up some things to do that. I definitely missed out on a lot of social things. But in about eight months of me committing to doing that, I was able to leave my job. I could have left in four months, but I didn't want to screw over the people that I worked for seeing as they were my family. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> you know, I was thinking about that. Like, like, there's a lot of people that try to do a side hustle until they can transition out of their regular job. And in your case, your bosses knew it was happening. <laughs> like, Yeah, they knew because I was very open about it, even with my boss. And I was very open. But I don't think that anyone ever believed that I would leave. I don't think they ever believed that I would make it. I think that they thought, oh, there goes Tanya with one of her grand ideas again. And I don't think they really took me seriously. I used to tell people that I was leaving them crumbs. So I would say little things like, oh, I'm going to leave one day. Like it's not going to like it's not going to be in 10 years from now. And they're like, oh yeah, sure, sure, Tanya. And it was only a couple of weeks before I actually handed in my resignation where I said to them, no, like I won't be here in the summertime. Uh, good like, for you. Good girl. That's awesome. Yeah. And I had to turn down promotions and everything because I was like, no, I'm not going to be here. You were a woman on a mission and you made it happen. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So I think that being able to do that, you have to really focus on the high value things. Like you can't do any of those shiny object things because you really have to be focused. If you only have two hours an evening to create your business, what are you going to use that two hours for? Because it's certainly not going to be working on your freaking logo or writing up your website because that's not going to get you a client. That's not going to make you money. So focusing on the high value things. Yes. I was, I'm waiting. I'm like, repeat that again for everyone that's listening, that the logos, rebranding yourself the third time. So, okay, I'm going to insert a story of inspiration for people. When I was about a year into my business, my first website was $400 from somebody on Etsy. Now, just laugh at that for a second because anyone that's in business, like why would you go to Etsy for a website? Okay. So my website was literally from Etsy for $400. And I got an email from Cartier International in New York inquiring about my services. And I was like, no way. Like, this is a joke. Like I literally forwarded the email to my husband. I was at Walgreens and I'm like, this has got to be like spam or a joke, right? My husband, you know, Googled the address. He's like, it's the right address. Like reply back. And I did. And I ended up working with them for several years. And the moral of this whole story is it was a $400 website that you would laugh your butt off if you ever saw right now that didn't matter because when I got them on the phone and I had the qualifications, I was able to serve. The website was not what got me the business, nor would it have been if I had focused on that and not developing my skills and getting the word out there about what I was doing. So definitely do not put first priority, the branding, the colors, the website. It's, it's just not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And so many of my clients are making hundreds of thousands of dollars and do not have a website. Yeah. So I would rather have money in my pocket than a pretty website. Same. And I think that all the time because people will message me on Instagram and ask me like, oh, what do you think of this brand name? And what do you think of this logo? And I'm like, guys, you're focusing on the wrong things. Like the thing that you need to focus on are the people. How can you serve powerfully? Because money is always going to flow to you from a person. So business happens person to person. That's right. There's a person behind every single computer screen, every phone. Even if it's in a bot, somebody set up that bot. So there's a person behind that account. (laughs) There you go. And when you actually say you want to buy something, somebody, real person is going to see that message, bot or not. (laughs) So your initial challenge was obviously time. So you're juggling between a full-time job and hustling on the side to build a business so that you can leave your six-figure salary, which was probably a lot of security. So you're ready to go on this entrepreneurial journey and take the risk. So what happens next? 
So once I was there, once I was able to leave, like I handed in my resignation, everyone was obviously very nice and like, was like, wow, that's so amazing. But it's so risky, Tanya. I was like, what? I actually don't think that having a corporate job is very safe anymore. Like maybe in the past, but nowadays you could get let go. They can say restructuring. And then what are you going to do? So I think the safe aspect is to be able to have your own business, your own skills, to be able to make as much money as you want whenever you want and not to have somebody tell you when you can make more money or when you can go on vacation or anything like that. So when I left my job, firstly, when I left, I was like, oh my goodness, I have so much time now to build my business. When you're working on two hours and then now you have like 12 hours, (laughs) I was like, oh my goodness, this is such a luxury. So it was really fun. And I literally made like $21,000 in the first week of leaving. I was like, whoa, look at what you can do with one week of not working in a nine to five job. Yes. I was like, this is amazing. And I could take on more clients. I built another self-study course. So what I did when I left or what I did when I was thinking of leaving, like when I knew I was going to leave was build systems because systems were taking me a bit longer to create because again, I was focused on clients. So if you're focused on making money and working with clients, I couldn't always focus on having the elaborate system that I wanted. I had some systems, like I had a lead magnet, I had an opt-in, I had a webinar, but I didn't have, and I had a group program, but I didn't have like a self-study and all that stuff for people to purchase things without speaking to me. Yes. So I love that you said that you didn't have the time to focus on that because I think everybody can understand and, and can be shaking their heads wherever they're at is that yes, systems sound amazing, but it's an investment in time. You have to lay out that investment in time to get the return compounded over time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm a big believer in getting the clients first because there's no point in having a system if you don't even know if it's going to work. If you don't even know if people are going to want it, if people are going to get something out of it, get results from it. I think that the most important thing is to start working with clients first. And there are many ways to get clients that are not long-term. You don't want to hustle for clients every single day for the rest of your life. That's why you build a system. But in order to make the money and have consistent money coming in, you want to have a handful of clients first before you invest. Because also one of the things I learned along the journey is that you really do not want to purchase a system that you're going to have to rebuild in like four months from now. Yes. It's such an investment to build the system. You want to make sure you're choosing the right one that is... And when I say right one, I think you can agree with this. It has to be in alignment with your particular business, your goals. So it's not that one program is better than the other. It's really you need to know what it is you want now, but then planning where are you going to be in the next three to five years because it's going to be such an investment to build it up. You want it to be growing with you. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I was thinking when you were saying that is like, you want to be able to grow with it and you do not want to have to rebuild it. That's what I had to do. I used Infusionsoft at the beginning and then I had to rebuild it into ClickFunnels. And again, it was like a big time investment. I had to hire people. I didn't know how to use it. So I also had to learn while I was in the middle of launching things and it was very stressful. So now I am a big believer in choosing the system you want for the future and creating the business that you want to have in five years. Because if you start building the business that you have right now, that's the business you're always going to have. So by investing in certain systems that maybe are a little bit expensive, great. Use that as motivation to have consistent income in your business. When it becomes a non-negotiable to have money coming in because money is going out, it's a good kick in the butt. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> so, oh, I love having kick in the butt. Yeah. <laughs> I, I put lots of stuff in place in my business to give me a kick in the butt. I make my own team give me deadlines so that it gives me a kick in the butt. Yeah. But even when you said, if you're going to invest in something that might seem a little bit outside your comfort zone or your budget, what you're doing is creating your new norm because chances are you're of integrity and you're going to figure out how to pay the bills. You're going to figure out how to make sure you have what you need to run your business. And then you look back and you're like, I can't believe I was even thinking like that wasn't too big of an investment. It totally was the right investment, at least for me. So like I use Entreport and that was an investment in time, money, consultants, everything that I knew up front was going to feel painful, like literally in my stomach, painful, in my pocket, but painful to then get the results. And I would say now four months later, I'm already getting the results based on those investments. And I think that's a really great point because that is the key with an investment, right? You don't buy a house. Well, most people don't buy a house and not get a mortgage. They get a mortgage 
with the belief that in the future, they'll have that money. So I think of investing in your business in the same way. You're investing in something that in the future, you're going to have that money because this thing that you're investing in is going to allow you to create that income or have those clients coming in or make those sales because without it, how are you? Like some of my clients come to me and they don't even have a way to get paid. Like what payment system are you using? Because like, I don't know if this is different in the US, but in Canada, like you can't take email money transfers for your business. Like that's not appropriate. Not, so. Exactly. It's not appropriate. And if you, and that's a, a money mindset thing too. Like if you don't have a way for people to give you money, you almost have to ask yourself, is that a money mindset issue that you're making it hard for people to give you money. Oh, totally. I totally believe that because I ask my clients before they're ready to get a client, they have to have that all set up. Their whole welcome sequence, like their contract, their payment processor, the welcome sequence of emails, any documentation that they're going to give them, any workbooks or any memberships, like all of that has to be in place before you get the client. Because if it's not, then it's like an energy thing that it prevents you from getting clients. So if you do not have a payment processing, that's the first thing that needs to shift. Okay. What do you use? I use two. So I use Stripe for my payment processing for like order forms and uh, my payment plans. But for my self-study courses, I do have a PayPal button on the page. That's the only time I use PayPal though. Okay. I have a question for you and maybe a little bit of a comment on my end. Do you see your automation program, ClickFunnels, as an employee? It's kind of a loaded question if you've never thought of that. Mm, that's totally a really great question. I never looked at it like that, but that is exactly what it is because I chose ClickFunnels because I was able to put so much into it. Like my membership area is in there, my order forms are in there, my sales pages, my opt in, all of these different aspects of it. It covers all of them and it integrates with everything I needed because that's the other thing you have to look at is what integrations do you need? If it doesn't integrate, I would check Zapier because they might have an integration. It's like one of the best apps ever. It's like a magic pill if there is a magic pill. Zapier does all things magic with integrations. Seriously, I've talked to their support before and I'm like, this is like the most important thing that any business has. Because like if your systems don't integrate, you're screwed. Yeah, exactly. So let me elaborate a little bit. So my word for 2018 is scale. For me, that means scaling in multiple ways. I have like broken down into different areas of my business what scaling means. And gearing up for 2018 and already having my word set in quarter four of last year, I knew that I needed to invest in an automation system. So the first level of scaling to the next level that I wanted to go to in my business was through the automation. And I looked at it as another employee on our team. Team, that it will work for itself. That once I tell it what to do, it becomes smart, right? That's where the automation comes from. And it's almost the best employee. It doesn't talk back. It, once you tell it what to do, it's always working for you. And then the layer on top of that was, so now in February, I had made two hires of real people. So for me, I wanted to start first with automation so that I could get that. And also the person that helped me set up the automation and then layer up with other leverage through employees. But I, I don't know. It's kind of maybe a little corny, but I definitely saw it as a main player in leveraging through other people, which was the automation. I love that because it definitely is one, it's the cheapest employee you're ever going to have, even though it might look expensive. Believe me, it's the cheapest employee you're going to ever have. It's imperative in my business. Like my business doesn't run without it. And like, if you want to keep a lean team, if you don't want to have huge business expenses where you're bringing in all this money and you're not actually getting any of it, then you're going to need automation systems. Like they do so much of the work now where in the past you might've had to hire somebody. And now there's so much tech that will help you do almost anything in your business. And then that means you only need a smaller amount of team. And like, maybe it's not always full-time people. Yes. Maybe you can contract people. Okay. So I want to know, so let's just recap here. You are an online business. So most people that find you is through the online world, but you're a business coach. I just want to preface that to the next question of give us an outline of all the automation systems you have. Like what type of things can be automated? Because I think that no matter what business anyone's listening to, they're going to get an aha because here's the thing was with automation. It's not industry specific. Now, the technical of how it happens maybe might be industry specific. But for example, the first one you started with was a payment processing. There are brick 
and mortar companies that do not have a seamless payment processing that goes into their accounting program where it doesn't need to be touched by a lot of people. So no matter what industry, I want you to listen up and hear all the ways in which Tanya is automating. Mm, yeah, that's such a great question. I'm glad you're not asking me for out all the software because I would probably not even remember how many of them I use. Okay, so definitely payment processing is the first one. And that includes like receipts, failed payments, which is something no one ever wants to contact people about. That you can have a system that contacts them with failed payments. Yes. So that you don't have to do it. Make somebody else the bad guy. I don't have that one. So I already learned from you. <laughs> okay, awesome. So like, yeah, purchases, payment plans, receipts, and failed payments is all under payment processing. Then I also have obviously an, a client enrollment automation, which is the most important one is when someone says yes, then what happens? So instead of me, which would take me a long time to send them a welcome email, to send them all the links for the membership area, for the Facebook group, for their link to book their first call with me, any of the information, like what should they do next, their next steps, any of their contracts, any workbooks that they need to download or anything they need to download, any reminders about like when are your calls or that they have to do something. So having something that makes them... Once somebody pays you money, like they want to get something. And if you're an online business or a service-based business, like if they just paid you all this money and then they get nothing and they have to wait till their first call, it doesn't exactly feel exciting for them. Like they just purchase something. So give them something like as soon as they purchase, what are their next steps? Welcome them and you can automate that entire process. So as soon as somebody purchases something, they go through this client enrollment automation. And with that, we'll talk about taking customer service to the next level because instead of sending a one-off like two sentence, thanks for saying yes, well, Welcome. Okay, we meet next week. I would imagine that if this is an automated system, like you sat down and took the time to say what it is you really wanted to say to truly welcome them, get them excited about what's coming up next. Whereas when we're like just fast and going from appointment to appointment day by day, we might not give them that level of customer service that we had hoped to give them. Mm -hmm. And depending on what business you're in, but what I'm in, like I only work with a very small amount of people a year and they're investing a lot of money. And so my whole purpose behind my business is I want every single person to feel like a VIP, right? Like to feel like they're not alone anymore, to feel like they always have someone with them to help them build their business. And so I have steps like really outlining, okay, what is their next step? Step one, step two, step three, so that it's very clear as to what do they do next? Next, and that this is how they contact you. And this is like what they should work on first and all of the stuff so that they purchase and then they have stuff to go on so that when they walk away, it doesn't feel like they didn't, like there was nothing else there, right? Like I could say, do they feel any different, right? If you walk out of a store, do you have a bag with you that you just purchased? So does your client have something that they walk away with after they purchase from you? Okay, awesome. So we've got payment processing and then client enrollment automation. What's next? Okay, the most important hands down is the lead generation one. That's like the sales funnel client attraction from somebody doesn't even know you to booking them as a high-end client. So that one's like the thing that I think is where people should start with their automation. Obviously, payment processing is important. I think you should start there. But the full like client attraction incorporates things like an email list, like building your email list and delivering courses, sending offers, but also like how does somebody get to know you? How do they even find out about you? <laughs> because there's tons of people out there and... It's not that there aren't enough people for everyone because there are, but there are certain people that are going to be attracted to you more than someone else. So how are you getting in front of those people? And then how are you nurturing them? Now, I'm going to be a little bit gross because the only way I find... The easiest way I find to describe this is like you don't go to a party and ask someone to marry you that you just met that day. So how do you get to know those people? How do you build a relationship with them before you ask them to move in with you, before you get to home base with them, before you ask them to marry you, you know, before you go through all those steps, like likely it's not going to be, oh, I just met you at a party and now I'm going to walk down the aisle with you. There are steps that have to come to warm them up to you, to get to know them, to build trust. And so that's how I see a sales funnel from not knowing you to wanting to marry you. I like it. And I, I do something very similar. And again, I just set this up to the level it is at now in the last 30 to 60 days. And I really had to sit down and say two points. How can I serve them based on what I 
believe their pain points are. So like really coming from a place of contribution. How can they get to know me and my personality so that if I were to get on the phone and talk about services, they're not shocked on my perspectives or my candor or my straight talk. They're expecting that. And if I were not to show up that way, it would be such a disconnect. So you really want everything that you're doing through this journey to be you, right? And they get to know you. That's why you need a good copywriter who actually makes it sound like you. <laughs> exactly. So I, I, mine sounds like me, but might have typos. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Well, that would be like me. <laughs> okay, there you go. There you go. So I think the sales funnel is great because you really, while you do need payment processing, it's a whole mindset thing. Ultimately, at the end of the day, if you don't have a way that you're nurturing and bringing in people, you really don't need that payment processing. So you got to start with the lead funnel. <laughs> Exactly. And like the, if people don't know about you and then even if they do find out about you, like I find a lot of people will come to me and say, okay, I have a lead magnet, but there's no email sequence after that. So there's no building that relationship. They don't offer them anything. So often I see that people are not selling anything. Like you always got something to sell. So like if you're sitting there thinking, I don't have anything to sell right now, like, okay, you need to go look back at what you're doing because like you always should have something to sell. So yeah, so like building that whole thing because also some people say to me, Tanya, I see you everywhere. Well, that's the whole point of a sales funnel. It's like you need to be in front of them all the time. It's like a commercial. Even if they're annoyed by you, which can sometimes be what email marketing feels like, we all feel like we're being annoying, but it works. So if commercials didn't exist, we wouldn't buy any of those products. And so... Nobody wants to watch commercials in between their TV show, but we do it because we're forced. Same thing with email marketing. Right. <laughs> and they repeat those commercials over and over again. Oh my gosh. Everywhere you see them, you'll see them on the TV. You'll see them in the newspaper. You'll see them on billboards. You'll probably see them on the internet. So the key with a sales funnel is that it's not just email marketing. It's also Facebook ads. It's also Instagram ads. It's also instant article ads. It's also like between your video ads. It's also on Insta stories. Like you want to be everywhere. You want to be in their email box. You want to be on Facebook. You want to be on Instagram. You want to be in their articles that they're reading on there. Everywhere that they're going to be, you want to be in front of them so that when that moment strikes that they're like, I need this thing or I need this help you're the first person who's at the top of their mind. Because if you're not, someone else is going to get them as a client. Right. And being in all those places, part of that is, is that they're not really seeing you in all those places. People have their own habits and where's the places they go. So some people spend most of their time on Instagram. Some people spend most of their time on Facebook or some people never read an email to save their lives. So you need to be a little bit of everywhere so that at some point they are seeing you. Yeah. And like, even if they never read your email, the fact that their name is in your email box so that you have to say unread or delete it, you're still, they're still going to take that in subconsciously. Consciously. So even if they're not necessarily clicking or reading or opening, they are seeing it. It is in their view. And I think that's also a misconception where people are like, nobody's ever opening my emails or nobody ever clicks on my link or books a call with me. Just because they're not taking action doesn't necessarily mean that they're not watching. They're just not ready yet or you haven't offered them something that they actually want yet. Yes. Well, I think that's true with Facebook too. And my podcast, because I put stuff out in the world. And I'm like, nobody's listening. And then I'll go to an event or I'll run into somebody and they know everything about my life. And I was like, well, where were you? You didn't comment. Nobody liked it, but they know everything. People are watching. And I, gosh, I just have to be reminded of that all the time. I just had an incident with somebody listening to my podcast. And I honestly, I wouldn't have ever thought that person listened to it. And then to find out it's really helped them. And I'm like, you've got to tell me this stuff. That's what keeps me going. Like podcasting is not an easy thing. So you never know. People aren't always participating the way that you would expect them to participate. Mm -hmm. That's such a good point, especially with podcasting because you don't get that interaction. So there's no way to know if people are listening, how long they're listening to and like what they're liking, what they're not liking. So I mean, one, remember that people are listening, watching, even if they don't tell you. And two, that if you are one of those people who's not clicking or not watching or not reading or not saying anything, please do. Because <laughs> yes. you know, it helps us keep going. <laughs> so for anyone that's listening, please drop either one of us an email or a line, just letting us know what you thought of this episode, because we'll be listening up and listening to see if anybody's listening out there in the world. 
<laughs> exactly. Exactly. We all need yeah. a little bit of that, but also like giving that to yourself. Like I'm a big believer and maybe this is because I'm fiercely independent, but sometimes you can't rely on other people's, what's the word? You, you can't rely on other people. Affirmations. To, like a, yeah. Yeah. You, yeah you can't rely on people to always be telling you how great you are. So I'm a big believer in like saying that to yourself as if you're your best friend. You can say like, oh girl, you're so, I used to say, damn girl, you were good at that. Or like, <laughs> damn, like I pretend like it's not me, like in a different voice, <laughs> but like <laughs> whatever you got to do to keep going, because also noticing the things that you're great at are going to help you because nobody follows anybody who's not confident. So if you are doubting yourself, people can feel it. People can see it. They can sense it. So you need to feel good about what you're doing. And if no one else is giving you that kind of feedback, like give it to yourself. That's right. So again, I'm a big believer in affirmations. It's episode nine. I actually, and you might not have heard this one, but I interviewed my son. I do affirmations with my son every day. And so I had him do a podcast with me talking about his affirmations, how it helps him, how it prepares him to go out in the world and be his best self. So we got to learn through a seven-year-old and I just love that episode. That's amazing. And actually there's a girl on Instagram that I follow who actually wrote a book. It was called like eight, ABCs of affirmations or something like that. It's like really cute to teach that early because like, I think it really is important because I mean, when we were growing up, they certainly didn't talk about affirmations. No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. So I can tell that you and I are going to be fast friends after this and man, <laughs> yes. So I don't often have people on the podcast that I don't know up until this point, which I've been very, very fortunate of, but you were referred to me and I reached out to you and we were going back and forth. I'm like, oh my gosh, she could be my soul sister. I didn't even know. So I'm, I'm really glad. I feel like we could talk forever, but I want to get through, maybe we'll have to do a part two someday, but I want to get through these automation systems for our listeners. Are there any other automation systems that you use in your business that you think would be helpful? Absolutely. Okay. So there's also things like, this is one that my clients love is like, I have this automation again, it's with Zapier the lover like integrates everything. So if someone books a call with me, it also sends them an automated email with all of the information. And you can set up automated replies to your emails, to little things that people click on. Zapier is amazing for that. You can even automate things like Instagram or Pinterest or Twitter. Go look at Zapier. It literally has integrations for everything. It can even create Excel spreadsheets for you. Tons of things. So I use... Any of the administrative tasks like scheduling or automated emails or even like confirmation emails, or even when someone books a call with me, they fill out an application. But even after that, I like to ask them more questions because if they don't reply, I cancel their calls. Mm, that's good. That means they're not invested in the call. Exactly. So... But for a long time, I would sit there and have to reply to everybody that booked a call with me. Again, that's something you can automate because Zapier allows you to input like little form, like they can pull from the calendar invite or the um, like the scheduling software. It will pull the information they input in there. So you can say like, hey, and then put their name. Same way with like an email it will input that information so that at least then again, some of the automated replies, you're not actually sitting there doing them and you're not hiring somebody to do them. So any sort of administrative task, check out Zapier. They have so many integrations that you can do that with. And then I love social media automation because I'm big about scheduling. I'm not going to sit there. I don't really believe that a six or seven figure business owner is sitting there on social media all day because there are so many social media platforms and not enough freaking time to do them. So anything that you can schedule out is amazing. Like Facebook has a scheduler already in there. You can also use any sort of automation system for that. But even things like um, I love many chat for like telling people about when you're going live or to tell people about your webinar details, or you can even set up sequences so that if they never open an email, they can still get some of that information through their messenger. Plus, if they contact your page in the future, you can do Facebook Messenger ads, which you can't do unless they've messaged your page before. So that's like a future thinking about in the future. Yes. Again, setting up your business for like 
success down the road. Yes. So I'm on the tipping point of looking into what the chat bots look like and many chats with the program I was looking at too. So it's a whole new world and it's definitely another layer of how do you get in front of people automatedly so that you can just start the conversation and then you jump in live. We were talking about that before we recorded. How do you reach more people, but then take it to a one-on-one conversation once you've pre-qualified them to then be someone that's super interested in your services? Exactly. Like you're not using it for everything. You're really just using it to start the conversation. And then like even with social media posts, you're writing it. And then whoever comments, I'm big about like engage with every single person that comments, even if you think it's a bot, because you don't know, it could be a real person. And they also might reply to things that their bot wrote, right? So... Oh, I do not do that. If I a bot. I'm like, no, thank you. I also schedule because I'm a big believer in batching. So it's all my content. I'm the one that created it, but I'm going to batch schedule it. And then that allows me the leverage and time needed to then be available for the interactions that are real person one-to-one. If I was trying to do all of that, I wouldn't have time to catch all the comments and the conversations and things like that. Mm -hmm. And even still like that can be a lot to deal like to handle, but making it a conscious effort because again, business happens person to person. So I'm a big believer in engaging even when you think it's a bot because one, more engagement means that that social media platform is going to show it to more people. So it will get a higher engagement rating, right? So then it will be shown to more people. But also like, who knows, like if they're using a bot and their bot left that comment and you reply to the comment, and I usually reply with a question, that way it keeps the conversation going. But if you reply with a question, then maybe that person is actually going to reply and that might connect you. And it has connected me many times with somebody who is a real person who's interested in what you have to offer. Okay, girl, that's my challenge. I always leave every episode with a take action and that is going to be mine. I will make a concerted effort to reply to the people that I think they're like, awesome picture. And it's a quote or not even a picture, but there might be someone behind there. I'll give that a shot for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think like there is a person behind that account. So you never know who it could start, who it could connect you with. So I'm all, I'm all about it. (laughs) All right. So let's close this up with, give me a few examples of how, you know, girl, with all this automation, I know personally how much time and energy and money was put into doing this. But what are some of the benefits for doing that now? Because it was true investment, as we spoke about earlier, but give us a little insight into what has that allowed you to do in your business or life? Mm -hmm. Oh, such a good question. So I set up this automation. I've obviously tweaked it along the way, but I set it up originally in 2016, October, November of 2016. I did a big tweak in the in April of 2017. But since then, I haven't touched it. So like, it runs for me and it brings me qualified paying clients every single week. So I'm booked out with my calls every week through my automation. And it's also moving them through the like up the value ladder so that they're becoming my one-to-one clients or they're going into my LEAP program or now my SOAR mastermind. So I'm not having to do some of that nurturing because then the sequence is already nurturing them. My Facebook ads are nurturing them. My trainings are nurturing them. And even when they sign up for something, I don't have to do any of that administrative stuff. And people are always saying to me, Tanya, how do you have so many programs and then and work with all these clients? And then how do you have time? Because I golf every single day in the summer. How do you golf? Like that takes four hours. So like, how do you do all of this? And it's because I'm not doing any of that administrative stuff. I'm only working with my clients. I'm only working on creating content or showing up or engaging with people. I don't have to look for clients. I don't ever like hustle for clients because my sequence does that for me. And then I just cancel people that are not qualified or that are not my ideal client. And I don't need to worry about like, oh, getting people on social media. My system does that. So it's helpful to like have consistent income, have consistent clients when you're not doing it all on your own. And yeah, it took some time to put in place, but now I don't have to touch it and it's been running for almost a year. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all of this amazing stuff. I'm like just thinking back at this episode and there are so many nuggets. You've been so valuable for me too, I learned, but our listeners, I'm certain of. So how do our listeners get more of you or find out about you? How do they get into your world so that they can see all your awesomeness? 
Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I also have a podcast. It's called the How We Hustle Podcast. And it's all about things that we're learning or things that we're doing in our business, in our online business, and then teaching you or sharing with you how to implement that as well, as well as some of like the mindset challenges or when we're feeling like something's not working, we're sharing that too, because just like you, I don't want anyone to ever think that it's all roses and butterflies because it's definitely not. And I don't want anyone to ever throw in the towel because they think that what they're going through means that it's not going to work for them. In reality, we're all going through those things. So if you want to hear about our entrepreneurial struggles and triumphs, you can listen to the How We Hustle podcast. Ah, oh, that's amazing. Okay, this, this is great. And okay, so do you have anything? Did you say you had a special gift for them today as well? Yes. So I have a training because I used to struggle with doing video. I was very terrified of getting visible with video. So now I have a training that um, helps people learn how to get visible, how to overcome some of those fears and self-doubts that come up when we're about to go live or do a video of ourselves. And then also like how to structure your video so that it actually gets you paying clients. So it's called the Quit Hiding and Get Visible training. Okay. And how do they find that? They go on your Great website? Question. Or, yeah. Great question. <laughs> it is on my website, but it is also available at... I'll give you the link, but it's on my website also. It's called the Quit Hiding and Get Visible training. But I'll, I'll send you the information so that you can share it with your audience. Absolutely. So that link will be in the show notes for this episode. And I will go into more of that and the recap what I do after our interview. Thank you so much for investing your time with us today. And you have been just such a wealth of knowledge, inspiration. And I'm so happy that we were connected and that I got the opportunity to have you on the Productivity Straight Talk podcast. Thank you. This was so fun. And I'm so happy that we got connected. This is definitely a friendship for life. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll talk offline how we're going to have like virtual drinks or something. But until then, I hope you have a productive day. Thank you so much. While I have loved having you listen to Productivity Straight Talk, I need to be straight with you. No change, no change. Without taking action, nothing will change for you or your business. So based on what you learned, what will you take action on today? I'm sure that you got a huge list of ideas from Tanya today about how you can automate almost all things in your business to create so much freedom, so much efficiency, and so much flow. So don't get overwhelmed. Choose just one because I, in fact, took the list from my interview with her of things that I wanted to ensure that I got implemented and automated. And I have been ticking them off one at a time. I do not want you to leave here feeling overwhelmed. I do not want you to feel like you need to do it all at once. The key here is to choose the one that will reclaim the most amount of time. Once you have that implemented and you're reclaiming time through automation, you take that time and you invest it into executing on the next automation system. And then you go from that one to the next one. And don't try to start all these automation systems at the same time. You really need to consider each of these as their own mini project. So I would love to hear which automation systems you perhaps already have in your business. And I would love to hear which automation system you want to implement based on this episode. And to share those insights and actionables, I would love for you to join me on the inside of our private Productivity Straight Talk Facebook community. If you're not already a Productivity Straight Talk insider, then you can join us by going to productivitycommunity.com. Again, that's productivitycommunity.com. Just leave me your name and email address and I will send you the link to join us on the inside. And if you've enjoyed this episode, I would be so grateful if you would share it with another entrepreneur who would find it valuable. You can easily share it from right inside any podcast playing app. There's generally just a little button that says share and you can send it out via text, email, Facebook messenger. It's so easy. So do me a favor and think of just one person who you think would find this valuable and share it with them. Well, that's my straight talk for you today. Until next time, have a productive week. Yeah.